Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It's a New York City block, 52nd between Lexington and Park. It's a documentary film recently debuted at the Tribeca Film Festival. It's a unique form of civic engagement, the act of giving back. It's the Lou Rudin way. To talk about the Lou Rudin way is Bill Rudin, president of Rudin Management, a major real estate developer and building manager, and one of the country's largest privately held real estate companies. Bill is also the chair of the Association for a Better New York, better known by its uh, acronym ABNI, and sits on the boards of NYU, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a host of other organizations. He is also sitting on Mayor Bloomberg's Commission on Poverty. He is the son of a city father. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Doug. Let's talk about the block, 52nd between Lex and Park. How did it become Lou Rudin Way? Well, it started, uh, you know, my father and my uncle and grandfather built 345 Park Avenue in the uh, mid-60s, uh, and uh, it's our premier office building. And uh, my father used to leave the office and go to lunch, whether it was the Four Seasons or 21 or the hot dog stand, literally yes. on the corner. And he would always say that on that corner, he can conduct more business in a half an hour than any place in the world. And he always talked about companies leaving New York and going to the suburbs. And that was a terrible mistake in his view because companies would lose the interaction, the power of being together in New York City. Okay. So after he died... Uh, Which was shortly after 9-11, and we'll talk about that a little bit he later. He died on September 20th, 2001, of bladder cancer. But afterwards, we thought, what an appropriate way to honor him. Uh, Mayor Giuliani, who was still in office, and Speaker Peter Vallone uh, uh, helped us get it through the city council. The mayor uh, signed it in uh, early December. And then in the spring of '02. Mayor Bloomberg, uh, who had taken over as mayor, uh, and Speaker Gifford Miller, and the family, uh, my Uncle Jack, and my wife, and uh, Rachel, uh, uh, my father's uh, widow, and my sister, and, and his grandchildren, uh, we all were there to unveil mm -hmm. the Lou Rudin Way. And it was a big event, and one of the things that we'll see when we talk about the other, the Lou Rudin Way, the, the documentary, is the affection that everyone had. I know Peter Vallone person. Everybody has this deep talking to people for this interview. There was everybody was just there was you could just see them smiling at the other end of the line. Well, he was a very unique man, and uh, he loved New York City. Uh, he loved his family first, and he loved New York City after that. And anybody who would disagree with him on New York City. Uh, would have a earful from him about uh, how great the city was. Well, as the documentary shows, I mean, you've got you've got some featured players here. I mean, you've got every mayor, you've got Presidents Bush, you've got Gerald Ford almost doing a mea culpa about and explaining how he didn't say drop dead and he really didn't mean it. Talk about the documentary. How did it come about? Sixty minutes. Excellent production values, a real history of a family, but also of the city. Classroom ready, I might add. Well, we were, uh, my father, before he got sick, uh, a year before he got sick, he got sick in 2000, uh, he had been talking for a period of time about trying to find somebody who we could tell his story, mm -hmm. the family story about how my, uh, his grandparents, uh, my great-grandparents, Lewis and Rachel Rudinsky, came to the United States in the late 1800s with nothing in their pocket, came into Battery Park, because that was the immigration depot before Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. And their reason to, to come to New York, because they, had, they couldn't uh, own property in Russia where they came from, and they couldn't practice their religion. And they were looking for economic and uh, religious freedom. And he found somebody to start telling his story. And he created about six hours of videotape. Wow. And then after he died, it took us a while, and we listened to the tape. It was very emotional for us. And I, you know, we started talking with Jack, my uncle, and my sister, and my wife, Ophelia, and the rest of the family. 
And we thought he really, his story and our family story and what he did and his, and his associates did in the fiscal crisis in the 70s really warranted a, a full scale uh, film. So we went about, I hired a friend of mine, David Hoffman, uh, who was a, a well-known sports producer and, and TV producer. And we started doing interviews with people who interacted in his life. And you mentioned some of the people. And uh, it's just uh, we literally have hours and hours of more video from people. Uh, we couldn't include everybody. And so over the last four years, we've been editing down uh, Sidney Poitier, who was a good friend of mm -hmm. uh, my father's. Uh, we brought him in to do the uh, the, the voiceover and be the uh, the spokesman, so, you know, for the film. And uh, we just worked very hard. Uh, Sandra Roberts, my dad's longtime uh, assistant, uh, who knew you know where everybody was, knew everything, and she came in and helped us. And we hired a writer, and it just evolved. And we sort of created different segments. And uh, the hard part was doing the editing and figuring out who who should be in, who shouldn't be out. And it was it was a wonderful experience. And uh, how does it debut at the Tribeca Film Festival? And how does it get on Channel Four, where I'm channel surfing? And there's this story that I watch for the next hour. Well, the Tribeca Film Festival. Our friend Jane Rosenthal and her husband Craig Hadkoff were the uh, co-founders of the film festival. And uh, we originally were going to show it uh, in early April. And I sent out a save the date. And she called me up and said, "You can't." You, you have to do it with the, in the Tribeca Film Festival. Your father was about New York. The film festival is about New York, and it was the perfect uh, venue to do it. And she was right, and we debuted it there. And then uh, Frank Comerfeld uh, of uh, Frank Comerford of uh, WNBC is an old friend, and I had been talking to him about it. He actually helped uh, with Felicia Taylor on some of the interviews. And they had agreed to uh, to put it on no commercial free, right. uh, and even showed it on their digital uh, network for several uh, runs. And because they saw how important it was, and they wanted to get that message out, and thought his story was a New York story, as you talked about before. Totally New York story. Let's turn to the documentary, and this this first clip really lays out what you alluded to earlier: the immigrant experience, where Louis Rudinsky comes from Russia in. 1883 and has a drive and a dream. It's, it's classic America. I mean, I look at my family, your family. Some of us don't go from rags to riches. We go from rags to something <laughs> else. But it's, it is that drive, that, that, that dream that motivated him and your family as New Yorkers. Let's turn and, and, and look at that clip. Okay. They came from modest beginnings. His grandparents, Louis and Rachel Rudinsky, came to America from Eastern Europe with very little. Lower Manhattan was his point of entry. Since his arrival occurred before Ellis Island was set up to process immigrants, he came through Castle Clinton, which is now a part of Battery Park. Somewhere along the way, his name got shortened from Rudinsky to Rudin. As a new immigrant, Lewis took a variety of jobs and eventually owned a grocery store on Christie Street on the Lower East Side. In his mind, America was a place where he could do two things. He could practice his religion, and the second thing was to own a piece of real estate. He told a story to his children who told it to us that uh, one day there was a price war going on, a oil price war, and one day John D. Sr., the governor's grandfather came from his office at 25 Broadway and up the east side. One day, John D. Rockefeller, on his way down to Lower Broadway to his office, he was in his horse-drawn carriage, and apparently he used to stop off at different shops. Or I believe there was a kerosene price war or something like that at the time. Old man Rockefeller was coming down to the Lower East Side grocery stores. One day, he went to my great-grandfather's store. And I guess in the course of their conversation, he said, well, where do you live, Mr. Rockefeller? And old man Rockefeller said, I live on 54th Street. So he was, I guess, very impressed with that. And he always wanted to move his family uptown. His ideal place to live was East 54th Street. When his lawyer called him and said, Louis, I got a, a house for you. You want to move the family up from the Lower East Side? I have a house for you on 54th Street. And Louis apparently said, I'll buy it, sight unseen. But of course, it was on the east side of Park Avenue, which was in those days, you know, the wrong side of the track. But he didn't care. My grandfather was supposed to have said, I'll take it. 
And he said, don't you want to look at it? No, it's 54th Street. If it's good enough for the Rockefellers, it's good enough for me. It's now part of 641 Lexington Avenue. Tore down the old buildings there. My family made it into an office building, I think, in the early 60s. So it's our longest investment. Some people have it for music. Some people have it for writing. My grandfather, my father had it for real estate. Really a remarkable story. Now, you're fourth generation Rudin, and there is a fifth generation root of, of Rudins that will continue this. We'll talk about that later, but this is, this is, but it's only a century. I guess that your father bought his first building, one in 2005, uh, 1905? Uh, uh, my great grandfather, yes. Great we, we, last year we celebrated the 100th anniversary of us owning real estate in wow. New York. It was something he was very proud of, and in, in the movie you'll hear the story about. Uh, him, uh, why he picked 54th Street, because Mr. Rockefeller lived on 54th Street, but he didn't realize that Mr. Rockefeller lived on the mansions on the west side of, of uh, 54th, and what he bought was on the, on the east side, which was literally on the wrong side of the tracks. But we own a 30-story a, uh, office building today. It's very successful and uh, uh, very proud that uh, the next generation who are in college or just graduated from college are looking in the real estate business. Uh, some of them will be in, some won't, but uh, uh, we're, you know, we, we, we are a very strong, knit family and love each other mm -hmm. and have been working together for a long time. That was striking in, in the documentary as well, the closeness of the family. Uh, your father was called Mr. New York. I used to think that, like, uh, the whole Mr. New York thing, I thought it was an official title. Like, I, <laughs> I used to think that, like, everyone knew this was the guy. How did he become Mr. New York? Well, if you, as you see in the video, he, he, he lo as we talked about before, he loved the city, and he did, he did so many things. And we didn't cover in the documentary uh, a lot of the other things that he worked on. He helped get the Concord to land in New York City. He helped get the U.S. Uh, tennis open to move from uh, Forest Hills to Flushing Meadow and help build the stadium there. Right. Uh, he helped in terms of Lower Manhattan in the early 1990s when downtown was at the, the bottom. Uh, we had 30 million feet of vacant space. He, with myself and other people, worked together to make sure the downtown recovered. Uh, so there were there's so many things that were in, involved in his life in terms of New York City, and the moniker just, you know, he would give people the big apple, hand out the apple, and that the title just sort of grew on him. Yeah, but and, and he did the I Love New York campaign. He, he transformed the, the marathon from a local Central Park race to this five borough international well, race. And in fact, the trophies or the winner's trophies and the resident winner's trophies are named after your grandfather the, and, the, 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 and father. Well, the, the, the winner, the, the men and women finishers, the elite runners, they've been getting the Sam Rudin trophy right. since 1976. My father and uncle uh, were approached by Percy Sutton to help underwrite the marathon back then. It was only going to be one time in the, throughout the five boroughs. And then after my dad died, we thought of, we tried to come up with a way to honor him in terms of the marathon. So the first New Yorker, whether it's a man and woman, uh, they get a, a trophy also. But uh, it's been a very exciting for us to be involved, and we love, you know, we love the marathon. And it's just a, a great day for the city of New York. Do you run? I ran in 1981. My wife has run. My cousins run. We're waiting for the next generation. Oh, the, so uh, you, you ran the, once? I ran once. Uh, once, uh, a, once, you know, quarter of a century? Yeah, uh, well, that's, you know, you're getting old, so okay. it's, it's tough. Okay, okay. Talk about your dad's role in the fiscal crisis. Uh, he is, in a sense, the linchpin of the glue, and in a sense, he's both the glue and the grease of the of the, the group of men and, and primarily men who saved the city in the 70s. Talk about that and talk about the rise of Abney, you know, an as well, the association for well, that in New York. He started Abney in the early 70s with a bunch of other concerned men and women uh, when they realized that uh, government couldn't do the job of solving the city's problems alone. That the, they, were, they were really the forerunners, which is sort of standard operating procedure today of the public-private partnership mm -hmm. that has developed all over the city and all over the country. And what they realized that they needed that civic engagement that you talked about before. And they were, it was really self-preservation because if they didn't engage, 
you know, for our real estate company, as my dad always talked about, and, and somebody mentioned in the video, he couldn't, we couldn't move our buildings. Right. And Capital so, so, and labor can move, you can't move your buildings. So we, we needed to, to put a stake in the ground right. and get involved with the problems, whether it's, you know, the cleanliness of the streets, crime, telecommunication, transportation, all the things that are the basic fundamental services and important issues that make the city attractive and bring people to New York, whether it's business, people living here, or visiting here. And they, they created ABNY and worked together daily to bring labor, government, uh, the private sector, the not-for-profits in a room at a table this size and say, okay, what's the problem here? Can we, how do we solve it? You know, what's your expertise? Do we need to bring other people in to help solve the problem? And they really created that model of that public-private partnership. And in a sense, your father is a great convener, bringing people together and then having them see their mutual interests, developing consensus, and then moving on. Well, what, what, what he and my father, what he and my uncle and the other people who were part of ABNY had was credibility. They were honest. Right. They, 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 they were always, their, their word was their bond. It was sort of the, you know, it, it's the Lou Rudin way. It's really the Lou and Jack Rudin way or the, or the Rudin family way. It mm. was, it's rolling up your sleeves and saying, if you're shaking hands on a deal, that's the deal. If you're talking about a, a labor contract or a problem, how do we help solve it? And they had credibility with the unions. They had credibility with the business mm. community. And that's what they were, they, they, they brought to the table was, you know, trying to solve some of the ego issues, some of the, the, you know, the, the, the tough issues to get past those issues and try to figure out what was a creative way to solve the, the problem. And looking back, it almost seems like a unique moment where you have this, this consensus, where you have this, this vision, this drive, and these individuals being drawn together to solve the city's problems. Well, it was, it was sink or swim. I mean, the city was really on the precipice of, of going under. And people, unfortunately, until you get to a crisis, sometimes people don't react. And uh, that, that, was, that was what was going on in that time. And it was interesting in the interview with Gerald Ford, which right. I happen to have personally have done, I was told- You, you did the interview? Yeah, I, was, I did the interview and I was told by his staff that I was not allowed to talk about the fiscal crisis. So my first question was, how did you meet my father? And the, you know, the president, who was by himself with one Secret Service agent who was outside the room, he had no staff, and he said, I met your father during the fiscal crisis. And that just flowed into a whole conversation. I, and I think it was almost, it, it, not almost, it is a historic document when he says, I never said New York dropped dead. Right. And uh, it was very interesting to be in that room with him and listen to yeah, his no, perspective it must have been of, the, of the city at that time. What you what struck me about Lou Rudin and people's remembrances of Lou Rudin, and we're going to go to another clip, is his really New York centeredness. I mean, E. B. White could have written when he talks about the New Yorker who was born there, talking about Lou Rudin, and we've got uh, well, we've got two of those disparate people talking about it: Rudy Giuliani talking about loving the city, and 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 Clinton on. Lou Rudin's style and his, and his love for New York. Let's take a look. The feeling of New York was something that just, um, I think, dominated his life. He loved the city. He understood it. He understood the uniqueness of it. New York City is a place you either love or you can't deal with. And Lou was one of those people who just loved it. The suburbs aren't the answer. Denver and San Francisco aren't the answer. The answer's here. I always thought his uh, primary role in life, I think, was to be a good citizen. And he didn't want to do well in New York as much as he wanted New York to do well. Whatever problems you think New York has, you're going to have. It may take a month, two months, six months, a year, you're going to have them. Well, as you saw from that clip, uh, you know, Mayor Julian describes my father loved the city. I mean, there was no, there was no question about it. And he, you know, that, that, that was his focal point. It was something in his DNA that told him that he needed to be up there fighting for the city. And he's been, you know, he's been proven right. Look at the city today. Look at Mayor Bloomberg and what he's done. He, in, my, in my opinion, he is almost a disciple of my father. When you listen to Mayor Bloomberg talk about how great the city is. Sure, you took and, my question. And, Go ahead. And, well, but, it, it, but it's true. And, and he, here is a businessman who could have kept going with his business, but he felt there was an, he mm -hmm. had a higher calling. Mm -hmm. He wanted to come and serve New York City. And 
He's done an incredible job of, of continuing moving the city forward after 9-11. And what he's done in zoning, what he's done uh, in education, uh, what he's done in uh, just making this a better place to live, work, and visit. And those are the principles of what Abney was about and what my father was about. And it's gratifying to see that people like Deputy Mayor Doctoroff, mm -hmm. uh, Amanda Burden, people who really love the city and have come back to it and really uh, rolled up their sleeves to try to make it better. Right. Okay, so we've got three Lou Rudin ways. We've got the street. We've got the, the documentary, but also, as I noted earlier, and, and we've been talking about alluding to it, it's this bipartisan, nonpartisan, cross-interest view of we're all in this together. Bill Clinton, uh, at, uh, at your dad's funeral, said being in Lou Rudin's life was like being in a magnetic field. You were always being pulled somewhere whether you wanted to go or not. So it was this, there's this, 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 this spirit, but it, the spirit seems to have lived on in the sun and we'll see in the future generations. How do you, as a Rudin, feel about the Rudin family way, if not the Lou Rudin way? Well, it's, uh, it, it's, it, I mean, it's been a wonderful you know, experience being, uh, being a Rudin. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's great. I, you know, I, thinking about coming here, you know, I grew up and, you know, meeting Mayor Beam or meeting Mayor Lindsay or, uh, you know, Jack Javits or whoever it was, it was just sort of second nature. I mean, they, these people were coming in and out of our house. I mean, I remember as a young boy, my dad said, come on over, I'm, we're invited to Gracie Mansion for dinner. And I sat there with Mary and John Lindsay and having when I was, you know, 15 years old or something like that. And it was just part of part of our, our, our life. And um, it, it's, yeah, I, w learned so much from my father, my uncle, my grandfather, uh, and the way they deal with people, whether they were in office or out of mm -hmm. office. He, he, that was something very important, that whether you were on your way up or on your way down, they treated them, those people, exactly the same way. And it was, it's an important lesson that you, you know, are straightforward and honest and care about a person no matter what they're doing in life. But being involved with uh, the political aspect was always interesting to me, but also the real estate aspect and, and seeing how they mm -hmm. uh, treated their tenants and how they responded, very, very important. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know, my sister and my cousins, we all have that same uh, sort of sense of how to deal with people. And it's, 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 it's gratifying to get the response and to make sure that our tenants understand it and and like kind they they respond back to us that way okay let's turn to abney you're the chair of the association for a better new york which your dad and your uncle and other primarily real estate uh folks in in 1971 created and it really provides a cross-section of new york city's diverse life I, mean, I just looked at the list of your membership you've got over 300 members business labor education real estate health arts retail travel tourism and alphabetically you're from the aarp and abc to the ymca and your college what do you folks do? What's your what's your vision? What's your mission? What do you do? Well, I think our mission has adapted over the period of time since it was originally started. Because uh, whether it's a bid, a business improvement district dealing with some of the basic services have taken over for things that we did, uh, or other organizations, we are we we try to find issues that we can be helpful on, whether it's downtown, you know, even before 9-11, after 9-11. Uh, you mentioned the, the poverty, the, the Economic Opportunity Absolutely. Commission that, I, that I'm on for the, the mayor. Homelessness, we were involved with the mayor. So these are the type of issues, the, the fundamentals of making New York better. It's just we try to pinpoint specific areas and try to focus on several of them at one time to make sure that they get uh, they get accomplished. And you've had a focus personally on education. I mean, you've, you've developed a charter school for autistic kids. Well, you've been involved in education in a number of ways. In fact, if I recall, you do stuff in the colleges regarding uh, uh, career opportunities, real estate, et cetera. Well, we're involved in our family foundation, which my sister runs. We're right. involved in many different uh, aspects of giving back to the city, which 
it was important uh, in terms of the film, but we, my wife and I helped create a charter school for autistic kids. You mentioned uh, I'm chairman of the Battery Conservancy, which okay. is uh, a park in Lower Manhattan that just we just renovated a substantial part of it, and we're mm -hmm. trying to raise more money beautiful. for Castle yep. Clinton and a beautiful new uh, carousel, which will be very unique. So we're involved in many different areas, and those are the things that my grandfather and my father and uncle taught us that we had to give back to our community. It's sort of interesting, you know, you see the, the Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett right. giving their money, uh, you know, creating a huge foundation. We've been doing this for over 30 years, giving back to our community and giving to organizations within this city to help make it a better city. And Abney has got the best power breakfast ever. Your guests have included mayors, governors, presidents. Every mover and shaker either is on the podium or in the audience. If, if, if you want power breakfast, Abney is the power breakfast. Well, we try to create topical discussions and we try to, to get people in a room to continue that same philosophy of, of solving problems and, and trying to deal with the issues. And uh, yeah, we've had some incredible speakers, and uh, we're going to continue doing that and trying to, to make this city uh, uh, even better than it is today. Because as in the film, uh, Hugh uh, Carey talked about, uh, or John Sexton, sorry, the president of NYU, that my dad was never satisfied with the city. He always wanted to push it forward. And that's what we're trying to do. We're carrying on that legacy. And uh, it's, uh, it's gratifying to see the results that's going on in the city today. Okay, that ends part one of a two-part discussion with Bill Rudin. Next show, we'll talk about Rudin management. We'll talk about real estate. We'll talk about politics. We'll talk about government. We'll talk about Mike Bloomberg. We'll talk about the future of the city. Thank you. Thank you.